Welcome to Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me tonight are Alice and Jerry Foltz, longtime activists in this area and longtime activists full stop. Thank you so much for being here, Jerry and Alice. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, very much for the opportunity. So Jerry and I are fellow Rotarians. I guess that's probably how we met originally. I'm not even sure how we originally met because we're both Democrats as well. Mm-hmm. But um, so I've learned a lot about your, your very long collaboration with Alice. Um, you've been married for 54 years. You've known each other for 58 years. And you have done so much in that time, have lived so many places, raised a family, and you are involved in things here in this area as well. And I want to talk about the things that you're doing with the um, Center, Centerville Immigration Forum. But just give me sort of a, a little bit of background on where the two of you met, how you met, and uh, how you decided to start on this journey together. Because it's certainly taken a lot of twists and turns and gone down some interesting paths. You want to take that, Jerry? Sure. We met at college, Catawba College in Salisbury, North Carolina. Uh, Alice was a year ahead of me. Uh, she skipped first grade, so we're the same age. <laughs> and uh, we got acquainted uh, partly through the United Church um, Student Fellowship. Uh, the college is historically <clears throat> related to the United Church of Christ, both of us from that denomination, me from Maryland and she from North Carolina. At any rate, we were involved in choir together. She was the accompanist for everything that the choir did. And I sang, tried to, and uh, she got me involved in the newspaper. She was editor, so she had me go through the ranks. And when she left, I became the editor. So didn't get any credit for it in those days, but I put in more than enough time to be two courses or three. Uh, But I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And thanks to Alice for that. So then, so she graduated and you were still stuck at college. And what happened after that? I went to graduate school at, Uni- at University of Virginia and got a master's in history, and then Jerry was ready for graduate school after that, so we went together to St. Louis, Webster Groves, Missouri, outside St. Louis, where Jerry went to seminary, and I began teaching. So I, that was my high school teaching career, and for taught for four years outside St. Louis or and in St. Louis most of the time. Yeah. And I know, Jerry, you mentioned that you were ordained 50 years ago, and it just happened to be the year that coincided with Stonewall. <clears throat> yes, it didn't make an impact on me then. I was involved in other things. But as time went on, uh, somehow our paths intersected as what was going on in the country. Um, I got more involved in gay rights, uh, as we call it then, and it, it just became more of, of one of, having been involved in civil rights, it just was a natural kind of uh, thrust. Back in 73 was my awareness that there was a problem. You know, that's how long it took me. And um, from then on, we were both pretty well committed to working that way. And so you moved around, right, from, from one church to another church. You probably lived in a number of different places. Yes, it happened to be in the same conference, as we call it, where I even uh, originated in Maryland. My first church was in Maryland, then New Jersey, then Virginia, uh, in two different locations. And all along the way, Alice, <laughs> you, you were finding ways to, to fit in with the community. Right, and every community that we lived in was different from the others, uh, I think that in every place there were wonderful people and also ways to get involved and contribute in the things that were important to us. Uh, we got involved in the very first community where we lived in the civil rights movement uh, in small ways in some cases, but trying to make a contribution in Harford County, Maryland. And I, I, in addition to other things, I served on the very first uh, Human Rights Commission that was established in Loudoun County, uh, not Loudoun County, in Harford County, Maryland. About yeah. what year was that? That would have been 1969, probably, wow. 69, 70. Yeah, that's yeah. it. My husband, Tom, talks about 67, 68, and 69, and mm-hmm. what... what 
traumatic years those were. I mean, there was Vietnam, it was civil rights, it was the assassinations. There was so mm. much upheaval in this country. And we can see that by looking back now. Right. Historians have picked it apart. And I sometimes wonder if we're not living through that moment, that same kind of moment of intense upheaval in this country. And it will be apparent down the road as we look back on what has happened since 2016. Yes, I, I totally agree that this is a time of great social change in so many ways. Social, economic, and certainly climate change all are swirling around us and affecting uh, many people. And we are, we are not able right now, I think, to see how this is all going to turn out, and it's very distressing but hopefully out of the change that we see right now and that we're, we feel so acutely, hopefully, uh, we will, 10 years from now, be able to look back and see that there was growth happening at the same time that there's conflict. And uh, so you've got children and grandchildren. So, I mean, the, 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 leg the legacy that we all leave is what we've done well or not for those right. that, that we have brought into this world. That's very true. Yep, we have four children and nine grandchildren. So <laughs> lots, of, lots of family to consider as we think about all these big issues and, and some smaller issues that affect the people we know and love. You know, and, and what is, I think is remarkable that, that both of you have such an extended family of your heart. <laughs> um, you took an epic trip to Guatemala. <laughs> You know, you in, and again, we'll talk more about the Centerville Immigration Forum and the Centerville Labor Resource Center and the fact that in our area, immigrants tend to, you know, come from a particular country or even a particular place. And that's always been true of immigration in this country, whether you're German or Italian or Irish, you know, you tended to come over because you had family or there were people from your village or the, the little place you came from. And so that tends to be mirrored here in Northern Virginia, that there are communities of Guatemalans and people from Bolivia and from, from similar places. And so truly the family of your heart. And I know both of you are deeply engaged um, in working with this community, which is also very much in peril at this point. And for those of you who are just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. I'm talking with Jerry and Alice Foltz here on Radio Fairfax, and they are both involved in the immigration community and working with immigrants and have been for a long time here in Northern Virginia. So tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Centerville Immigration Forum. How did that start? I remember a meeting in a school cafeteria <laughs> that it was pretty fraught. In fact, yes. I think I have video from that meeting. But um, so, give us a little background. What what exactly started this? That was that was June two thousand ten. But before that time, what was happening in Prince William County, as well as Herndon, alarmed us as we thought about our own community in Centerville and Fairfax County. Um, the um, out-of-status immigrants in Prince William County were declared not welcome, and many of them were forced to leave. The police were given extra authority to stop and, and get them ID'd. Um, it was under the supervisors, um, and that was, that was distressing. The schools uh, lost a lot of uh, students, uh, stores uh, closed down. And in Herndon, even though the Herndon Center was only in operation maybe a year and a half it was a good operation as it as it ran, but with county support and the uh, voters began getting concerned about the use of their tax money because there were so many outsiders coming in to object to uh, all this. Uh, all this. Um, I think they called them the Minutemen. Uh, yes. There was some Minute of that, and, and, uh, and they were harassing people that were hiring workers to work on their home or with their business. So, and it actually uh, the production of the document documentary called 9500 liberty it's an address in manassas 9500 liberty is still available on youtube it is it that's that annabelle park yes. and and uh, eric byler and yes. i remember when they were making that documentary back in 2009 it's it's still timely it tells Very the story much so. and it was produced finally in uh, november 2009 by that time 
our, our church, you know, Wellspring United Church of Christ, was uh, having ESL classes Sunday afternoons at the library, free classes for anybody that wanted to work on their English. And we got to know people uh, then that were in the community, uh, especially the Guatemalans. And most of them that we know are from the same town in, in the Highlands in Guatemala. Many of um, they're the part of the Mayan community there where we visited last summer. So that's, that was the beginning, and we began having what we called uh, Centerville Immigration Forum meetings every month. They were forums <laughs> with no idea of where it would lead to, but initially we were trying to help people talk together about their concerns, their fears, their rumors. Sometimes we could put rumors to rest. Uh, our pastor it was a mediator, a uh, conflict transformation uh, teacher, George Mason, and he helped do that and Alice kept uh, kept the, the thread going with uh, inviting people. We met in different churches and the um, the group was di- pretty diverse at first and there were a lot of different opinions but gradually it it kind of evolved into a, a group of concerned people for the community and for the people living in our community and that was great. And it then, it yeah. really was and yeah. in, in the fact that the, the the center had been shut down in Herndon, and I remember very well because I lived for a time with my kids in Centerville in the 90s, up mm. to 2000. And the day laborers would be hanging out in front of the library, the Centerville Library, and this caused great consternation for people who didn't want to see people. And that was part of the problem in Herndon, too, is the location of people waiting for work. And so there needed to be a solution. And I remember that there was going to be this meeting in the cafeteria at the school. And, and so I was there. But the, uh, the delegate for that district had sent out a letter. And he basically riled up the community with, um, with all kinds of, you know, things that could happen and what could go wrong. And, and people turned out. It was, it was a heated sort of meeting. Not productive. Definitely was heated. At the end of that meeting, it had been so difficult. And as you said, the publicity that had gone out was uh, had, had encouraged lots of people who knew little about the local issue but were concerned about immigration in general. And uh, there were so many of them in the room determined to show the terrible ways that immigration could potentially affect the community, uh, that those voices were very loud and prominent, and the uh, supervisor, who was a Republican, Michael Fry, Michael was Fry. up front, yep. and Al Dwoskin, who had offered to provide space for a day labor center, was up front, and I was there. At the end of the meeting, it had been so contentious that I felt that probably uh, Mr. Dwoskin and Mr. Fry would withdraw. I said, there's no way that they will be able to continue this, but the opposite happened, as we know, and I think both of them felt that having a center could resolve the problems that the community had and that it was worth trying. And so we moved ahead and continued to plan. We adjusted, surveyed, and changed the location a few times, but Uh, we continued to move toward the goal. And I think that meeting also brought other people in the community who didn't like the tenor of the meeting. It brought them uh, to volunteer to support it. So in a way, that meeting had a a positive effect in spite of the fact it had been so negative. We know, I think, that, too, about the Trump election, Quite frankly, I mean, so many things have happened in a positive way because of something terrible. And so we kind of have to look for the fact that, you know, out of catastrophic things, there's also opportunity for growth. And then looking back at the 1960s, it, the same thing was true. I mean, things, terrible things happened, but out of that came a lot of growth. Um, and I think that's where we are right now with people stepping up and deciding that no one's going to come and save us, that we have to save ourselves. And that ordinary people are running for office or ordinary people are deciding to start a nonprofit or ordinary people are volunteering and saying, well, I don't like this. I don't like what's happening. This doesn't reflect my values. This doesn't reflect my community. And so I'm going to do something. And, and again, with Making Change Radio, that's, that's really what I, I wanted 
talk with people who have decided to do something. You may not be able to solve a whole problem, but you can, you can do something. Our motto at the very beginning was a local solution to a local problem. And we don't use that motto anymore because, partly because we don't like to say that immigrants are a problem. Right. You know, but we wanted to emphasize at the beginning that, that we were focusing on the local. We were not going to resolve the uh, national need for immigration reform, which we still have, but we were going to focus on providing local solutions that would serve the local communities, both the immigrant community of workers and the wider community. So we invited everybody to be a part of this solution, and a lot of people signed on. Uh, and I think the talking that we had done during those years that Jerry described made a difference, too, because people knew that this was a group where they could come and be heard. I think Michael Fry deserves a lot of credit. The man showed yes. fortitude, yes, truly, absolutely. truly showed fortitude. Sharon Bulova, I remember when we had the ribbon cutting, and I actually mm-hmm. have video of the ribbon cutting right, of the right. <laughs> Labor Resource Center. You know, there were people who stepped up and said, I believe in this, and I think it's positive for the community, and I'm going to support it. And interestingly enough, it seemed to me that it died down fairly quickly, like the pushback that had been generated by one particular delegate kind of dissipated because the the workers had a place to go. And talk about some of the – there are amazing programs. It's not just – this, you know, they're sitting around waiting for someone to come and hire them. You're doing all kinds of programming through the Labor Resource Center. Right. We have uh, English language classes, informal English la- language classes ev- almost every day, for about four days a week at least, uh, for the people who are waiting for work. They're drop-in classes, and they, uh, the idea is that we will try to help them learn something while they're there waiting. Uh, We also have uh, English classes at night, and that certainly is one of the things that from the very first time we were out at the corner before the Labor Center began, when we asked folks what they needed, what they wanted, the two things they said were jobs and English, and that still is true. Uh, So those are the two things that we work on first. We also provide skills training for folks to improve their skills while they're here so they're not just bound to one kind of job uh, while they're working and so we have skills training classes for painting drywall carpentry framing uh, and tile we've done all of those classes and we have uh, a wage theft project that has grown tremendously in the last three years Uh, many day laborers particularly those not who get jobs through the center, but day laborers who find employers through referrals from other friends or on the corner uh, are often robbed of their wages. They either don't get paid at all or they don't get paid what they've been promised. One of the things I remember from that first that meeting in June 2010 was this, an employer bragged about the fact that he hired day laborers off the street and didn't pay them, and that showed what they're worth, he said. To me, that is not something one should brag about. Uh, <laughs> really, it reflects more uh, on the person who thinks yes, that's okay right. than the person who was robbed. <laughs> right, but we're talking at that point, we're talking about slave labor, and as we all know from history, that undercuts the entire labor market. So wage theft is not good for anyone who is a working person in the United States. Our wage theft project uses negotiation mediation primarily to encourage employers who haven't paid to pay, and that's been very successful. The last couple years, we were able to return over $10,000 in pay to workers who had not been paid during the year. And these people come from the region. These workers who bring their um, cases to us come from the region. John Cano, our organizer, is in charge of this project, and it's been very successful, I would say. For those of you just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and today we're talking with Alice and Jerry Foltz, longtime local activists known to many in this community. And we're talking a bit about the, the, the founding of 
the Centerville Immigration Forum, and the Centerville Labor Resource Center. And I want to point out that not one penny of taxpayer money has gone to support this enterprise. Not one penny. And that is a source of great pride. And Al Dwoskin, again, should be given a lot of credit. He owns um, commercial property retail centers, and he is committed to this. And so that was kind of the, 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 the seed <laughs> the seed money, the seed start that you needed to actually have a place for people to go. And, and I think over the years, it's the relationships, the trust relationships that have developed between the people who come into the center and the staff that you have there and between the people who hire these day laborers and the staff at the center. Which, and those are remarkable people that you have there as well. Right. Our staff are uh, bilingual. And they work hard to make sure that the employer and the employee understand the requirements of the job, that the pay is clear, the hours are predictable, and that uh, everybody is satisfied. And then we check with the employers after the job is done and make sure that it's been satisfactory to everybody. So I think our staff are, are just great in making sure that those working conditions are kept. And I'll say, too, that the members of the center, the, the workers, uh, are determined to keep it that way and to do a good job um, because they know that that's the way more jobs come in. And we do have many repeat employers. Majority of our, uh, the people who employ at the center are homeowners. And I should add, too, that there are no fees for employers or for the workers. So the pay is done uh, through individually, each employer Right, there's no intermediary. The there's, there's no, no intermediary. intermediary. The, the intermediation that we provide is in understanding the job and making sure that the conditions are clear. Right, and, yeah. a, and accountability is important. You know, people <laughs> need to go in in good faith when they're entering into a, a contract, even if it's a verbal contract. And so right. people do need to be held accountable. You know, Jerry, I know our uh, Rotary Club in years past has done things to support the center. Like I think one year we gave money for um, goggles and gloves, I think, was one of just basic equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, what are some of the other things that it's a constant sort of um, ongoing way in which you're trying to support the workers at the center? Um, we uh, do backpacks like a lot of different groups in the community. Uh, the Some of the workers, of course, come from families, and uh, some are women, too, uh, some of the members. And uh, they have children, and they're in school, and the backpacks are needed for them, and the backpack supplies, that's provided by different groups, including uh, Alice's uh, uh, educational sorority, teacher sorority. Um, what else? I can't think... Uh, <laughs> Well, um, <clears throat> we've had donations of office equipment of different kinds, and uh, BB&T recently outfitted our staff with new desks, and oh, nice! Uh, that was great, and new refrigerator, awesome. So we've had donations from businesses like that, and we have had a lot of volunteer support. And I'll just say. We began as a primarily volunteer organization, and volunteers are still critical to what we do. Our morning ESL classes are all provided by volunteer instructors, and we have volunteers who participate in planning events and supporting the cultural events and community events that our workers organize, our members organize. Yeah. I should say that I think your listeners would be interested in knowing that not everybody that as a member of the center, uh, is an immigrant. Uh, some are local people. Some uh, We've had some homeless uh, uh, members at times and people from other countries. So it's not all Hispanic, even if they are immigrant. Uh, it's interesting. For Africa, Sierra Leone, uh, Alice knows uh, real quickly some now, of those. I'll say uh, we have had members who came to us at times of their lives when they couldn't get work for various reasons they uh, and they were looking for a way to get on their feet uh, we had one member who came and worked as a temporary laborer for for some months with us and ended up going out and starting his own uh, junk business junk collection business and uh, began to come back to the center to hire members to work for him uh, we have 
members who have been in the United States 15 or 20 years from, from other parts of the world who now have their own businesses and come back to hire. That's a real testament yeah. when people pay it forward that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and again, it's, you know, we tend to look at people in um, mm -hmm. poverty, for instance, as just not working hard enough. We tend to look at people in poverty as having a character flaw. Mm -hmm. And it's not. It's situational. And this is, this is a, a, a great example of how it's situational. Once you get back on your feet, you are doing something. You're a successful business person and you are reaching back. To help those other people who are in a situation, not terrible people, good right. people in a bad situation who need a hand up. A hand up, not a handout. Please join us after this break here on Making Change Radio. Keeping the First Amendment alive. We are Radio Fairfax, Fairfax County's public access and internet radio station. Radio Fairfax. What you want to hear, where you want to hear it. Hi, I'm Marianne Metz from the Melody Lingers On on Radio Fairfax. Join me in exploring and enjoying the Great American Songbook. We bring back the wonderful voices of Rosemary Clooney, Bing Crosby, Ella Fitzgerald, Judy Garland, and Frank Sinatra, just to name a few. And we hear some who are still singing for us today. So come listen as the Melody Lingers On. The Melody Lingers On, every Wednesday at 11 a.m., only on Radio Fairfax. Join Mike Delaney Wednesday evenings at 9 for a weekly meeting with the chairman of the board, a true American idol, Mr. Francis Albert Sinatra. That's Simply Sinatra, Wednesday nights at 9, only on Radio Fairfax. Tune in to the music that has shaped America's most dynamic art form called jazz. Join me, Robin Clemens, on Jazz at Club Paradise on Saturdays from 12 to 1 Eastern Standard Time. Listen in and hear recordings from the legendary masters of jazz and releases from young players who are taking the music forward. Join me, Robin Clemens, Jazz at Club Paradise on Saturdays from 12 to 1 Eastern Standard Time on Radio Fairfax. Welcome to Isla Earth. To the world at large, global warming is anything but a game. But if you happen to be on the internet, it can be. That's where you'll find a game called Climate Challenge. Produced by the BBC, it lets you be president of the European nations. Your job as Prez is to pass environmental laws and react to crises caused by climate change, all the while staying popular enough with voters to remain in office. The data driving the game are actual climate change projections from 2006 provided by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and most of the policies players can work with came from real government policy documents. But the producers of the climate change game want to make sure people know it wasn't meant to accurately predict future events related to global warming. Their goal was to provide players with a fun and challenging way to learn more about the impact of climate change and options governments have for dealing with it. So next time you're online, why not give it a try? With all the insights you'll gain by playing, there's no way you won't be a winner. And the Earth, too. Plug in and play by following discovery links for today's program at islaearth.org. Isla Earth is produced by the Catalina Island Conservancy with support from its Fund for a Sustainable Planet, because Earth is an island. Keeping the First Amendment alive. We are Radio Fairfax, Fairfax County's public access and internet radio station. Welcome back to Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight I'm talking with Alice and Jerry Foltz, longtime activists in this area and just longtime activists. When we went on break, we were talking about the uh, Center Centerville Labor Resource Center and the programs that they have there. We, we touched a little bit on some of the cultural aspects of providing a way for these new uh, arrivals in our country to be uh, together 
in ways that are not just finding employment, but things like a celebration and uh, understanding other people's cultures. One of the things that our Rotary Club, again, supports every year is the International Showcase, which is held every year in April. And it's not, as you pointed out, Jerry, it's not just Hispanic people. I mean, there's Koreans, a lot of Koreans in Centerville, and we have, you know, people from every, Africans and people from Ireland and people who bring their music and their food and their dance, and they share it with one another in a way that kind of highlights the rich diversity of Fairfax County, and particularly in the western Fairfax County region. Um, talk a little bit about some of the other ways in which you, you're trying to help people connect with one another. I think the International Showcase is wonderful, and we can always use a lot of volunteers to help with that, uh, and as well as people to come and enjoy the diversity, as you said, of food and, and dance and music. Uh, we, that, that is uh, held at Korean Central Presbyterian Church, uh, which has a wonderful space, and we're very grateful for their providing that space for us, and indicates the importance of the Korean community, too, yes. in what we do. We've had Koreans who volunteer to teach English at the Labor Resource Center, so that's a, a wonderful kind of partnership that we've had with the, with the Korean community. Uh, <clears throat> we also have an annual dinner, and that's uh, coming up soon. Now, the showcase is April 18th, 2020 so that will be the 10th annual showcase <laughs> but the annual dinner is in the fall and that's coming up very soon that will be September 20th and this year we're remembering our history we're honoring one of our members who was on the very first board of directors and continued on the board of directors for about five years I believe uh, he uh, came with his brother to the, to the United States from Guatemala in order to uh, make enough money to pay for his younger siblings to go to school. And when I learned about that, I was so impressed. And I tried to think of young people whom I had taught as a high school teacher in the United States. I tried to think of who I knew who would uh, sacrifice their own future in a way and go somewhere and work somebody work somewhere else in order to pay for the education of their younger siblings. That's, that's really impressive in itself. Uh, most people we met in those early years from, from Guatemala said, we're only here to work for a few years for a particular cause. Each of them had something they were going to do for their family back home and then they planned to return. Uh, as conditions have changed, uh, some of those folks have decided to stay longer. But this young man agreed to step up, even though he didn't expect to be here forever. He agreed to step up and serve on the board and create an organization that he felt would make things better for everybody. And that was wonderful. So we're going to honor him this year along with Al Dwoskin, and I'll be there and talk about some of the history that we were all a part of at that time. Because you are also being recognized and honored, <laughs> Alice. So let's not leave that out. It is you and Al Dwoskin and this, this, this young man who... Alejandro Santiago. Yes, yeah. Alejandro. Um, and that's important. I mean, we've gotten to a point where we can look back and say there is history. You know, it's kind of a long way, and yet, you know, it doesn't seem like it's been 10 years. I can hardly imagine that it has been, but it has been. But it only goes to show that, you know, you have to, you know, every climb up a mountain starts with the first step. And I just think people sometimes get completely overwhelmed by the enormity of problems. And they're paralyzed from doing anything because they think it's not solvable. And I think that's where we are with the situation right now with immigration. Um, there are children. The situation at the border is terrible. The fact that there are detention centers here in this area and that they want to put more detention centers for children in our area, which, which many of our elected officials are against. This is not uh, a, a, an economy we want to build, housing children snatched from their parents and kept indefinitely. You know, like, like private prisons, this is not something we want to grow here in Northern Virginia for the most part, I think. But, but locally, there are families, and, we, and all of us know families who are seeking uh, green card status. I'm, I'm involved with a family seeking green card status. They were granted asylum. And one of the big things is being told that they 
cannot be on any kind of public assistance because it jeopardizes. I mean, this is what they believe and this is what they've been told. You know, that they, if they accept any public assistance, there's a chance that they will not be granted a change in their status. And, and it's weighing heavily. I know, Alice, you talked about how it's weigh, weighing heavily on the nonprofits and the many organizations who serve people who need these services. About three years ago, uh, Center for Immigration Forum decided to call together some of our partner nonprofits, our colleagues who work with the immigrant community, and talk about what we could do to understand the changing face of immigration regulation and to deal with that as partners together. Uh, we had the first meeting of this season today and we had a room full of people from nonprofits, some from religious organizations, some who provide food, others who provide health care, uh, nonprofit clinics, uh, and <clears throat> all of us were concerned about the ways immigration policy has created fear in the community and made people afraid even to uh, participate in programs that they think might involve uh, public money. Uh, the fear, I think, is greater <clears throat> than the reality, but um, it's important that, that we find some clarity on what the rules actually are so that that public charge fear <clears throat> will not keep people from uh, participating in public life and getting the help that they need. Well, perception is a lot of it. You know, as you said, it may not be the reality, but then our public policy seems to change every day. You know, there are edicts coming out of the White House. There are executive orders. You know, the policy that was in place has now changed. You know, even, even going so far as like this, this specter, this specter of holding children indefinitely from their parents. You know, separating children and putting them in centers far, far away. You know, Virginia is far from the border. You know, how will we ever get these families back together again? The records being kept are not very good. You know, there is fear. There is fear on so many levels. And it's affecting people not just, you know, school children are in classes with classmates who live in fear or who've actually had their parents deported. That just doesn't affect immigrant children. It affects the teachers who are teaching, the guidance counselors, the principals, and the students sitting in you know the first grade classroom. The, everybody has ended up being affected by what is happening here. Mm -hmm. for, those of you, us, for those of you just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I am your host, Catherine Reed. Here on Radio Fairfax, we're talking with Alice and Jerry Foltz. And one of one of the things they are involved with in this area is helping with the immigration situation here locally. So, you know, Jerry, you often go with, with people to immigration hearings. I've only been to one. I've been, been to one asylum hearing, and I glad, I'm glad I went because the family was, a, was granted asylum. But they had a backup plan in case they weren't, like what they would do if they were deported, where they would go and... But you frequently are going with people. Describe a little bit about, you know, what you do in a support role when you go with people to hearings. Uh, it might be their first visit to immigration court, and they may go without an attorney, and I'm not an attorney, but sometimes I register as a citizen. There's a little space, a little place you can check and put your name on a sheet of paper so you can speak <clears throat> respectfully to the judge and to the government uh, attorney. But mostly... Um, the first visit is to get another date to come back with an attorney and then file maybe your asylum papers. But um, what I do, my routine from Centerville is to get on Metro with the person and we make another change to go to Arlington on South Bell Avenue uh, in uh, Crystal City. And we join a lot of other people waiting to see the judge in different courtrooms. Um, it's a new experience for a lot of people, but it's getting to be a little more routine for me. And um, I'm glad to have volunteers join me and see what goes on. It's a very, it's no risk except a highway, as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned, uh, being an um, American citizen and white too. 
So that's a, a point of privilege for me in many ways, and I'm just trying to help spend some of that privilege to benefit people just to keep them uh, a company and not have someone go in by themselves. I think that's the wrong way to go to court. Uh, so I feel like it's it's helpful. Uh, and when an attorney like today was there, uh, it was still good to, to help the person get there and meet the attorney. And I could be a part of, you know, getting the person home again. That's always succeeded. And so um, it's, a, it's a fairly routine thing in some ways. And yet there's always some new wrinkles. I'm always learning something. I meet a lot of different judges and uh, they're all different. But they they follow a procedure. They're respectful, and they always have translators for the Spanish speakers. And I appreciate they're trying to do their job. Um, but it's, it's a lot of work to get asylum papers together. The woman today uh, comes back with her attorney after all the papers are filed for a final hearing in four years. That sounds like a nice long stretch, but it's a lot of work goes on from now till that four years are up. Yeah, I know the family that I've been with. Uh, actually, it was a family that our Rotary Club adopted about five years ago um, for Christmas, for the holidays. And I've stayed connected with that family. They were granted political asylum a year ago, which means they can apply for their green cards as of today. But they have had to scrimp and save for a family of five. They had to scrimp and save $14,000 on minimum wage jobs, <clears throat> multiple minimum wage jobs so that they can actually apply for green cards. By the time they actually, and it could take, their attorney said, it could take six months to a year to even get those green cards. You know, by the time all is said and done, they will have been here like seven, almost eight years working the process. So when people are like, you need to come through the right way, you need to follow the right path, and you need to do the right thing, the right thing takes years and money and English and know-how and where do you show up and who do you talk to? So I think you really pointed out a volunteer opportunity that a lot of people have not even thought about, which is being the person who goes with somebody, not as an attorney, but just as support, somebody who speaks English, somebody who does have privilege walking into an immigration courtroom, to be there for that person, you know, is somebody they can lean on. And, and I wouldn't have thought of that either, quite frankly, but I know that you do it quite frequently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's uh, accompany people to a medical appointment or to a hospital. Uh, there's one person that has to go to Orange, Virginia for a dialysis three days a week with volunteer drivers. Wow. That's a nice little round trip and yeah. wait four hours for the dialysis to take place. We're trying to make that a little more convenient for him in Fairfax County, but that's, that's a demand that, that uh, takes a lot of uh, effort and planning. Uh, accompaniment and even to local court sometimes there's a uh, some kind of a citation that they have to respond to uh, and it's taken care of but still it's a way to accompany someone at, at no risk basically as far as I'm concerned the other thing I do is not quite an accompaniment but when someone has a relative that is uh, in uh, is an immigrant uh, detainee at some other uh, detention center and they have a chance to bail them out, uh, they can give me the money and I'll uh, produce a check to help uh, help pay for their uh, release. Right, because so many immigrants are unbanked, which is just another level of complication right. when you don't have a bank account and you need to <coughs> transfer money <laughs> mm -hmm. for things like... And, and isn't the main detention center... Um, in Farmville, Farmville, it is. Farmville yes. Virginia. The smaller one in Caroline County. Yeah, they're in very rural places. So when people get picked up and get taken away, they get taken far away. And again, transportation tends to be a problem. Unless you have a car, it's very difficult to get around. And a driver's license. And a driver's license. That's a whole thing all by itself. I'm yeah. not sure we're going to yeah. solve that. But certainly every year in the legislature, they make an attempt to get driver's licenses for undocumented people. Um and they have them in other places, just not in Virginia. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we'll just keep making a run at that every year. I would be remiss, actually, not to throw in here uh, that you are also a volunteer chaplain. Yes, with it, Fairfax County Fire and Rescue. For like 21 years? 22. 20, 22 years that you've been this volunteer chaplain. Um, you've done a lot of things, Jerry. You actually stepped up and ran for the House of Delegates as well in 2013, which I think is important because I think— we have to offer people a choice on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And I think that you wanted to offer people 
your values and give them a choice. And my hat is off to you because it's very difficult to do that. But it came from a place of believing that representative forms of government deserve more than one person on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I love the fact that you and Alice both live your values and and you have demonstrated it in so many ways throughout your long years of serving your different communities, whether it's in the classroom and you've got some very high profile students there. Alice, I had no idea, but you've taught some you've taught some people sitting in our state legislature and they just adore you. And so you just never know. You never know. Nobody's responsible for how they turn out. But but you educated them. That's the important part. So looking forward, I mean, what what are your up, upcoming goals? I mean, I know every year the legislative session is we're part time in Virginia and that will start in 2020. We've got the census coming up. That's a very big deal to count everybody. And there's a, a lot of fear around that in the immigrant community as well. And and yet I, I was speaking with somebody from the Islamic Center last week. Um, about the fact that every person who's not counted is like $12,000 a year in federal money that we don't get to support this community. And that's, that's turned out just to be a real pr problematic thing in this county. Right. Uh, I'd like to, I'm not exactly answering your question, but I'd like to backtrack maybe a sure. little bit and say something about why immigrants come to the United States. I think that's a really basic question that a lot of people don't have a very clear picture of. I'd say because of the relationships we've had in Centerville with the Guatemalan community especially and, and other, other communities, but also because of some of the travel and volunteering we've done in other places, we've learned some things about those questions that other people don't always remember, aren't aware of. <clears throat> I think uh, People often ask me, why do folks come to the United States from Central America, for example? And the big reason is poverty. Uh, the Most members of, at the Labor Resource Center are from one town, as Jerry mentioned before, Neba, which is in the indigenous area, the mountains of Guatemala. <clears throat> and those... Uh, it's a beautiful area, which we were privileged to visit last year. And the Your pictures are, were <laughs> amazing. You were there for a long time, and yeah, you the, covered a lot of territory, and it looked epic to me. The people were warm and welcoming, and it was a wonderful visit that we had there. The priest in the town uh, told us that <clears throat> about 90% of the people in his parish are living in poverty, and many of the people we talked to there talked about the great difficulty of getting jobs. Uh, the priest also told us that the biggest problems that he faces for the young people are suicide and alcoholism, which are related often. And this is because of the difficulty of seeing a future for yourself in the community. It's very costly to get educated. The public schools are not free. And... Um, so the opportunities for young people are very limited, and that's why people come. The United States has some responsibility for this. The United States has responsibility because the United States has supported uh, bad government and government that particularly brought violence into the indigenous regions and destroyed families over the course of about a 30 30 plus year civil war there. Um, and so that total disruption of family life and social fabric during the 70s and 80s <clears throat> had a lot to do with, with what we see today in the immigration to the United States. So I think that as we see immigrants, someone said to me one time that <clears throat> day laborers in the United States <clears throat> are the result of bad U.S. policy. Hmm. And I think we do, uh, we do bear some responsibility for the problems of those countries that lead people to immigrate. Of course, today there are new factors in addition to that history. <clears throat> there also is climate change that has brought drought to Guatemala and made it possible for farmers to make money in the traditional ways that they always have. Yeah, I mean... 
You're absolutely right. Climate change also has a bearing as well as American public policy. For those of you just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and we're talking with Alice and Jerry Foltz here on Radio Fairfax. So, yes, there is a reason people are coming. They risk everything. They risk their lives. They risk their children's lives. Um, they do it on. They risk deportation. They risk incarceration. <clears throat> They are risking being separated at this point. Nobody does that without a good reason. Nobody risks no, that true. unless you feel like you do not have any alternatives whatsoever. That's very true. Here, just in, we've got a little bit of time left, too. I kind of want to talk a little bit about your gun violence prevention work because both of you are very committed to that as well. That's a big issue. <laughs> In the, every day, every week, new mass shootings, the NRA is right here in our backyard, literally, literally in our backyard. Every month on the 14th, people go out and protest in front of the NRA at headquarters. That 10, start 10 a.m. Yeah, since no, Sandy Hook. Since Sandy Hook. But where are we with that, Jerry? Where are we with gun violence prevention? It's hard to say. I think when <clears throat> Congress comes back... There may be uh, a movement, but it may not really take root until after the election, if that's enough of a change. Um, and both in the state as well as the, the country, uh, in Virginia and, and the U.S., I, it's just I, I don't feel like I can predict. It's, it's terribly, maybe terribly true that it just might have to get worse before people do something, even though... How could it get worse? Like I said, I mean, when after Sandy Hook, when when all of those little children were mowed down in their elementary school, if there was not the political will yeah. at that point to do something, then how can we be surprised that on a regular basis it happens over and over and over again? Yeah, the Washington Post mentioned, I think it was this morning, that 90 percent of the Americans want to have a couple of those things that would help reduce gun violence. But Congress is not doing it. The Senate is nothing. You know, and so let's talk about who populates our elected offices. Mm -hmm. As I try to remind people, 2019 is an election year here in Virginia. Everybody's focused on 2020. It, we're not even there yet. <laughs> in Virginia, this is the, we have a four-year cycle. This is an off-off-off-year election. What that basically means, and everyone needs to remember this, is about 30% of the voters in Virginia in any one community will decide who is on the school board and the board of supervisors, who your sheriff is, who your commonwealth's attorney is, who's on the soil and water board, who is your commissioner of the revenue, who is your delegate, and who is your senator. 30% will decide for all of us who is in those offices. And this is a time to vote your values because if we can't gain movement on gun violence prevention in the commonwealth of Virginia, it's because of who is sitting in those seats. The most important thing people can do to combat gun violence is to vote. To vote. If you don't like the values that your elected representative is putting forth in the Senate or the House of Delegates or on the Board of Supervisors, for that matter, then you need to vote on November 5th. Yeah. And some of those changes that have been proposed are basic common sense changes that are certainly favored by the majority of the people in Virginia and in the United States. And uh, we, we need to have votes on those proposals instead of refusing to talk. And that's true. And, and because our chambers are uh, held by a majority of two seats by the Republicans, basically this legislation is kicked out in committee and never even goes to a floor vote. And again, two people and a majority par party can kill the legislation from ever getting a fair vote. And so I'm encouraging people here in our listening area, people across the Commonwealth, to remember it's not about 2020. At the end of the day, local government determines the quality of our lives. Yes, yes. Yeah, and that's true of the Board of Supervisors. Yes. I mean, we've had, we've, you know, the Centerville Immigration Forum, Forum has had many allies, many friends on the Board of Supervisors, and a lot of those seats are turning over. People truly need to pay attention to these local offices because it's going to make a difference going forward in the public policy that we all have. I want to thank you both. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks. I want to remind people that the dinner is on September 20th, 
and the International Showcase is on April 18th of 2020. And if you want to be involved, if you want to get engaged, there's so many ways to volunteer. And you can go to CentervilleImmigrationForum.org and find out more about how you can support this amazing organization. That's it for us here at Making Change Radio.